I'm not sure if we had technical difficulty or not, and either way, we are back in Ari Mizell. Here we are. Again, let's let's do this, man. So less doing, we're talking about that. We you mentioned how you started, kind of how it got you got into this, and I guess tell us a little bit about some some simple ways if you were gonna explain to someone without taking the course, without kind of diving into the meat of it, what are some just general ways people could try to do less and kind of pick up some extra time in their day? Yeah, so the, so the overarching framework that we teach is something that we call optimize, automate, outsource. Uh, so that is the the way that we approach kind of all of these different problems. <clears throat> and the, the reason that's important is that a lot of people will try to outsource first. They'll use that as like the first line of defense. And there's sort of an inherent problem with that because if you take something that is inefficient and like that you don't really know how to do really well yourself, and then you give it to somebody else who has less understanding than you do and less experience and less everything and then expect this result that is somehow better than the one that you were gonna produce yourself, it just never kind of works. So we have to start with optimize. And with optimize, what we're really doing is looking at how you do what you do now. And while that may sound simple, most people just don't do that. Uh, if you think about it, right? There's like a, there's so many opportunities that are lost where we get this sense of overwhelm and we just kind of go through the day. And human beings are really good at just sort of putting their head down and like pushing through. But it takes a little bit more effort to stop and say, wait, why are we doing things the way we're doing that? What does this process look like? What are the steps involved? Uh, so a lot of that is just tracking and looking uh, specifically at what, where and how we're using our resources. And so I know that sort of sounds very general, but if you were to, for example, look at how you're spending the time in your day alone, even some time tracking, it's, it's really usually very eye-opening for people or how many emails you get in a given day versus not. A lot of times, if you ask somebody at six o'clock at night, what'd you get done today? They really have to like, think about it, they have to go back and look at their calendar, like there's so much stuff that just happens in the given day. So stopping kind of looking at how and why is, is really important. And also what that does is it takes processes that are in our heads and memorializes them in a way that other people can do them or other things can do them. So that's the most important one is to start to look at that stuff. The second part is looking at automation. So we never want to give something to a human being that we can automate because that's like by definition dehumanizing work. And we can automate things now that a week ago a person had to do. It's, it's fascinating what technology is enabling us to do. And in some cases for free. So you start to look at the things in your life that are triggers and actions. So if you find yourself saying the word every, that is a that should be a signal for you to look at some sort of automation because you know every time a customer signs up, every time I do a, a podcast, every time I sign up for a service, every time I fire somebody, whatever it might be, the every should be that sort of signal for you to look at how you can possibly automate it. And once we've done that, once we've auto optimized and automated, then that's the first time you should be looking at outsourcing to some sort of specialist or generalist. So that, that general framework, I think, is one of the probably most helpful things for people to think through. Yeah, I, I can, you know, just also, I think it's, from me personally, it, it becomes a, it's it, that's super, super, super hits close to home because it's like, at what point do you just say, all right, you know, let's delegate, let's push everything off. You, you need to kind of get, get your foundation sorted out. So I think that's like, that's one of those things that it's very, very tough to decide. And is that something, so your course, is that something you cover? Like, how do you, do you break that down? The less doing course, uh, I'm gonna, I'm over here. I don't know if you can, I guess if you have it up on the side, you can see. So we have, uh, this is the one that I'm going to on March 6th, which is a course here. And, and is this, is this something you cover in the course? What is the actual course cover like when the live course and then the online version like is this what you guys go over or what is the the meat of the course less doing yeah so we've got the we sorry my phone's like making noise for some reason um <laughs> we've got the intensive which is what you're coming to in new york that's the one day so it's actually it's the same content the online course and the intensive the online course is delivered over the course of 10 weeks uh with uh group coaching call that's done live every week to sort of take people through the material. And then the intensive is like all in one day with me hands on and we get some time to actually implement a lot of the stuff. So yes, that that OAO framework is the baseline for everything that we teach. Uh, and then everything else sort of builds off of that. And we, we focus on three main areas, which is project management, communications, and processes. And then there's sort of three sub areas within each of those. But I have a very specific method that I've created that we teach for all of those things because I've worked with companies 
from you know, pre-revenue all the way up to making hundreds of millions of dollars and governments and everything. And looking at communication first always seems to be the big one because if we can get communication working better, uh, everything else sort of flows from that. And all of these organizations have challenges when it comes to, to communication. Even if you're a solopreneur without a team, uh, the way that you have your vision figured out and what you want to actually do and the decisions that you make and how that co communicates to your clients, uh, communication really is key to being uh, more replaceable. And I want to ask you, because I just I haven't heard this actual word. My wife mentioned this to me, who will be coming to the course as well. Uh, the Pareto principle about the 80-20 type rule. Right. Is, is that something I, I, I'm familiar with the 80-20 rule and, th you know, wealth, land, these type of things, what you're effective. Is, is this something that is you cover or is it a variation of this or, or how, what would you say in terms of that? How does that play into um, your, your, the less doing and, and the whole like what do you, how do you feel on that? So Pareto's principle is 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 really crucial uh, in terms of thinking about how you organize the various sort of resources that you have at, at your disposal. I, I actually so my first book was called Less Doing More Living, and that was much more about the personal side of things. I'm actually talk about the eighty twenty rule in that book, and it's valid, but it's it's very basic uh, in a lot of ways, right? So I think that what we're that won't really come up in this course per se. I think that this. At, at this level, it's it goes way beyond Pareto principle, and not just looking at eight twenty, but what your actual peak time is, and when is the better time for you to do uh, creative work versus admin work and things like that. So we can we can drill in a lot further. But I would say at an eighty twenty level, if you get communications figured out, that is eighty percent of the battle to get all the other stuff fixed. And so okay, and then so with the. When you when you actually so you you have four children is that right? Yes. Four children. I, I saw. I believe they were spaced out. I think that was right. Two years apart, roughly. Um, how how much did it? How much were you before you had your first child? Like, did, did something click or register when you were? Was it was you, were you doing this long before, or is this something? Because for me, I had my first child um, do in end of April, and it just seems like already I'm just like, wow, there's so much going on. And people say, you know, you have no way of preparing, be ready, like you just don't know what you're signing up for. And I mean, four kids, it just seems like, I guess, how do you, I don't even know what I'm trying to say. It just seems like, it just yeah. seems overwhelming. Like how, how has having children, has that affected your, 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 your program, the way you approach things like from one to four or how long before you had one child, were you already in this mindset and having this type of program or did this kind of kickstart or get you even maybe more focused? Like, cause could you argue that you could be more, you could have more time with having more responsibility, more kids. Is that kind of like the, the premise that you need to be more organized? You need to be more efficient uh, to enjoy these type, to enjoy your children and, and family life. Like, is it, what, did that kind of give you a spark or were you already doing this before you had children, this whole, this whole methodology? Yeah. So I, I was definitely doing this before, before the kids came around. Um, I think that uh, technically this started about a year or two, maybe before our first child. But it's, it's interesting because I, I feel like that massively accelerated things when we did have the kids and a lot of what I talk about is creating artificially restrictive limits in your life if you don't have them. And while that sounds, it might sound crazy, the thing is, is that a lot of entrepreneurs seek entrepreneurship because it's a form of freedom, right? And we see it as uh, freedom from the boss or freedom from the grind or whatever you want to call it. The problem with freedom is that the human brain doesn't do very well with freedom. We are very bad at making choices when we have too many of them. Right? We're very bad at getting things done when we don't have a deadline, uh, generally speaking. So freedom is not the best thing when it comes to productivity. And so in my case, I, my restrictions were not artificial. I mean, I had a, a chronic illness that was making it so I had very little time in the day to get stuff done. And then we had one child, 14 months later we had twins and two years after that, we had another child. So we have we had four under four, I think, basically at that point, uh, which is you know, insane. And 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 also not a ton of fun, I'll tell you. Like there was definitely fun moments, but people always talk about how like you'll remember the days and how you'll miss it. Not not it's not true necessarily. Like I'm okay at saying like it was really really hard. And you know, building a business and we built a house and moved three times in that whole process. Uh, so. It's it, but that madness, uh, it could have gone one of two ways, 
right? I could have basically just sort of shut down and been, you know, two steps away from a heart attack essentially and just gotten through it. Or I could have done what ended up happening, which is really have a thriving life, uh, work while my kids are at school. I was the head of the PTA at our school last year, which was a terrible decision in itself, but I did it, you know, and, and so yeah. I, I'm able to organize the life that I want and I can leave and work anywhere I want in the world at any moment with, with no notice. Uh, but I, those, those things would not have happened without those kinds of restrictions in place. And not that you need those in your life to be able to be productive, but I've been the sort of guinea pig to figure those things out for a lot of people. And, and the, the wrapper that I would put on that is uh, I know that we're, I think we're about the same age. Were you ever a MacGyver fan? No. How, how old are you? I'm 36. All right, 32. I mean, I I respect you got to respect the MacGyver hustle, but yeah, I, I uh, I'm not. I never like got into it or was was watching a lot, yeah, but I, I know about them. Yeah, you know, you know of okay. course. Well, so the point is, and most people have some sense of you know MacGyver. The point is, like nobody ever said to MacGyver, like, hey, there's a Home Depot across the street. Go get everything you need and go across the street and like, blow up that building, right? It was always like, here's a, a box of Bisquick and three paper clips. Go blow up that building, right? So to me, like restrictions are fascinating, and I think that we can be so much more innovative with restrictions than without. For sure. No, I mean, it's a, it is a, it's an. I find myself. I will admit, this is. I'm just. I'm hoping, I don't know if it does, it's not like a go do a course or you, you know, what, do something online or one day is necessarily gonna change your entire life. I mean, for me personally, I just, the, the emails that build up, you know, the, like you just mentioned about a day goes by at 6 p.m. and then you look back, it's like, oh, what did I do? You know, I can't tell you how many days that I have had where it's like, I, you know, I have like a list or I'm like, I wanna do this and then you know, it's just like, it's unorganized where you get calls, you have, it's like whenever you have these like, these built up things that just don't really, it can, it can stop you from getting stuff done. So I think I'm just like, I'm just so anxious to get to this course, check it out, really dive in, find some, some, some quick, you know, not, I guess it doesn't happen in overnight, but just to get in some good practices on how to be more effective with my days. Cause I do feel there's a lot of days where I just like, wow, where did the day go? What did I get done? I want to do all these things. I only got a few done. And I think a lot of that's with distractions, not being fully focused and just having a lot, a lot of things going at once. So uh, I'm, uh, I'm definitely looking forward to the course. I think this is something that, you know, Elliot Rowe, he was, uh, I remember asking, him, I was like, is Ari the real deal? I wanted to kind of get confirm like is this is he really like uh he can he can actually change your life like is he is he in his industry this is the guy and he's like yes it is you know i highly recommend it um i'm fascinated by it i think uh it's something that you would say you would you what what percent do you do like one-on-ones or is it for the course or people online like what percent are people doing this online versus coming into the course how many how many live courses have you done so uh, we do the intensive every other month right now, and okay. they've been all in New York so far, but actually coming up in June, we're going to do one in LA. Um, I'm actually probably going to be doing this in Saudi Arabia. Like it's a really portable format, which is great. That one day really intense, which is, which has been great. So we've done uh, a handful of them so far and the, the results have been really amazing. Uh, but specifically like, so tell me some of the things that are really frustrating for you right now. Where do you feel like you're not getting enough done? Yeah, so for for example, I'm project managing on a one of my buddies is he started a uh, Twitch basically network. It's called Thirst Lounge Ten. So I'm helping with mm -hmm. that. I have my own. I have my wife's seven months pregnant. You know, I'm kind of like looking, trying to spend time together. It's not just like oh, let's get as much done before the baby comes. It's like well, this is our mm -hmm. last time together before the baby comes. So you know, that's obviously. Which is great. It's just that's a it's a lot of you know trying to trying to be present, spend time with her, project managing that. I just left um, Poker Stars where I was a sponsor for a year and a half, getting everything in order for the next phase on what's going on. You know, it's I'm in a good a good spot where I have a lot of things kind of coming in where I get emails, I get requests, and then it's just kind of like almost I feel like nothing quite gets done. Like I, you know, I wanna study at poker, I'm making content, I have uh, Vadrin the, in Croatia who was troubleshooting, helping mm -hmm. us get this thing started. Like he, he helps me with a lot of stuff that, to kinda of organize my social, all that, but I just feel like I'm missing a component of organization, like a manager or an assistant to sort of, uh, to help optimize my stuff. I just kinda of feel like I go through the day and it's like there's all these things that start building up, I take care of a little and then I'm just getting behind. You know, it's like. 
I handle a couple things, but new stuff comes in. I get backlogged and just never really. I, I, my inbox is not zero, and I've gone. Th- I've made it like a mission. I have like 248 things that are in there, and then I have even a folder where it's like to do, so I can kind of clear it out. But it's just like I, I just can't get that email to zero. I can't quite get caught up on everything. That that's sort of my problem. I just have a hard time to really push forward. I just feel like more stuff is coming, and I don't want to complain because it's one of those things. Like I feel very busy, but it's fun stuff. It's just like I can't quite, I don't, and and then all that stuff kind of comes at me, right? It's like, oh, now taxes are coming up. I got to get organized for last year. But just like optimizing, uh, you know, Praxis Metrics, AJ and Megan, like they flew Mm -hmm. here actually. They spent some time with Eduardo and I, and that's like, you know, I want to get, I just want to feel more organized with everything. And I just feel like everything just kind of is like always around me. And I just, it's just like, I can't, my mind doesn't rest because there's just so many like things that are just, I just can't quite get handled. Like I want to be able to do one thing at a time and just systematically move, but I'm more, I'm more uh, scattered, you know? I'm more of like a try to do multiple things at once. I'm the guy, I got 12 tabs open on the side. I just, I, I don't know. It's just who, it's how I am and it's worked for me. I just know it's not the most efficient way. Yeah, I got it. Um, so where is that to-do list that you mentioned? Where does that live? Uh, it's it's in notes in my phone. It's a note on the computer. It's uh, it's in my head, but generally it's a, it's a note. Like I have like a to do pending note, but like you know, also I have pieces. I just like with poker, I have so many pieces and pending sweats, and you know, I think part of it is um, the more I think about it, and the more I hear, I think it's almost like a distraction. You know, I'm trying. I'm like just, I like to have like action constantly things firing and it, it's it's just all over the place but I do have a note like I have a to do note in my phone and I also on my desktop I have a notepad that I kind of try to for the day do but I mean I can't tell you how many days I'll like go through and it's like I don't even really get through one you know or uh, like not fully close something off so I think there's part of that just being systematic would help a lot just I don't I can't seem to find a way to do that yeah, well, so that is actually very specifically something that we're going to teach you at the intensive. So, and that's we and that we teach in the online course as well. The the big problem without you know giving too much detail here, it's not about not wanting to give away the concepts. It's just that it's hard to sort of describe this sometimes without being visual. But uh, the biggest problem with most to do lists is that they're vertical, uh, and so it's a list which most people are familiar with. Whereas it really needs to be horizontal and have several phases. So if you look at uh, what's known as a Kanban style of project management. We have several columns, which are or lists, and then each task is on there. There's a sense of movement towards a goal. And every, the, the, the at the very basic level, a to-do list has to have some form of to-do, doing, and done. And to-do should be the things that you're gonna do this week. Doing should be the things you're doing today, and done is done, obviously. And then there can be several other phases within that, but at the very least, those sort of three as an arc uh, make it a lot easier because the problem with most to-do lists is that they enact a psychological uh, part of our well, a psychological phenomenon in our brains called the Zigarnik effect, which basically all it does when you look at most people's to-do lists is it all uh, at a subconscious level, all you see is the things that you're not getting done, which makes it very very hard to actually move forward, which is what you're experiencing. So uh, some of that is psychology, and most of it is just the way that it's laid out visually, honestly. So uh, if you think about those of you out there who have a to-do list that is a vertical list that maybe you cross off throughout the day and maybe it's in a journal, maybe it's on your phone, whatever it might be. If you just think about turning it on its side and how you can move from one phase to the next and think about the different phases that you have in it, uh, that'll actually make a really, really big difference. Well, Ari, I'll tell you what, I'm, I am, like I said, I had to ask Elliot a few times. I just was like, you know, it almost seems too good to be true. I remember you flew into the course in Vegas. I was there with some super, it was super interesting. That I got a lot out of it. I thought that was really, really unique. I see Ryan Carter in the chat as well. Two legends. What's up, man? Brian Glick checking in as well. Uh, you know, I love that you came in. You just like shot in for a day. It was like a two-day course or a weekend thing. And you were there for, I believe, one full day or maybe you were there for a day and you left in the morning. I was like, man, this is pretty, pretty strong. You flew in from New York to come check out and, and speak. And then, you know, for me, it got my attention. I'll say this. If you get my inbox to zero on March 6th or, or you know, after that week after, let's say following, I will be, I'll tell you what, man, I, I don't know. I don't want to say something crazy what I'll do, but I, I mean, I'm already, I'm already a fan of your message. You are and a how buddy, you man. Do it. I just like, that would change 
my life. I feel that this is like such an incredibly interesting topic that like you said, it's like visual. It's not just like you can say, oh, do this or go through your email box or do one thing at a time. You know, I'm, I'm very curious on the course and your methodology, can't even say it, method, methodology, if that's yeah, right, cool. on how you do it. But I just like, it's fascinating to me because I know this would genuinely change my life if I can, if I could have what you preach. And um, could, could you give some examples? Has there been, have you had any aha moments or any people that have kind of come through or skeptical or, or kind of, I mean, is that, is that typically, can you say like, once you do the course, is that something to really, is that like what you, the inbox zero is your, it's a separate thing, but is that something you will, you teach on how to get your mailbox to zero, how to go through? Is yeah. that, is that what this less doing is about? Or is that completely separate? No, no, no. That's huge. That's a really, really important part of this because so one of, one of the modules that we'll teach you is called the three decisions, uh, which is really about, uh, it's about inbox zero, but it's about decision-making in general, because the interesting thing about inbox zero and the email problem is that it has nothing to do with email. It has to do with decision making ability, which is, by the way, fascinating to me since you're a professional poker player, right? And you have to make all these decisions with all these different sort of factors coming into it. Uh, the inbox is probably one of the, and, and I'm sure you have, and I am not a poker player, so, but I assume that you have some systematic way that you make your decisions when you're at the poker table. Yes. Well, well, you like to think so. I, I yes, I definitely right. do. Yeah. <laughs> okay. You probably don't have that when it comes to your inbox. Uh, and all you need is a system for thinking through things. And fortunately, unlike at the poker table, or, and again, maybe, maybe it is the case, uh, but at least when it comes to email, you don't need to make the 30 or 40 possible decisions that most people make when they look at every single e message in their inbox. There's only three choices. Uh, and it's what we call the three decisions. So it's something that, that we absolutely will teach and you will be an inbox there on March 6th. And it will change your life because you'll see how that extends to making decisions in general. And you get to, the most important thing is that you get to take control of your communications rather than your communications taking control of you. And can you can you mention what those three are? Is that too big of a course giveaway? I mean, I guess no, obviously I, it's like, delete, you, you do, yeah, well, so I'll let you tell us then. What is it? So the three decisions are you can delete it, deal with it, or defer it. That's it. And there's a lot that goes into the and in explaining how that works. But uh, if you look at this in sort of decision making in general, one decision is to say no, decline it, right? You're not going to do it. Don't respond. There's a lot of emails that we respond to that don't require a response. So if you find yourself sending an email that says, thanks, got it, great, like don't send those emails. Uh, because the more email you send, the more email you get. Uh, the second one is to deal with it. If you can deal with something right now, deal with it right the, the F now, you know, like, because there's only th this idea that we have in our heads that like, oh, it's only gonna take me a minute. So actually this, I'll take a little sidebar on this for a second. There's so many things that happen in life that we don't do, not because they're too hard, but because they're too easy. Okay, so if you look at, uh, so a great example of this is I am currently probably five pounds overweight. Not a big deal. You wouldn't notice, I wouldn't say, but I'm, I'm about five pounds heavier than I think I'd like to be. The problem with that for me is that I know that if I focus on it, I could be back to where I want within two weeks. And because I know that, I haven't done it, right? Because it's like, oh, I'll, I, I know I can do it. I know what the plan is. I'll do it when I need to, but I haven't needed to necessarily. So uh, dealing with it later is the same kind of thing. If you can deal with it right now, deal with it right now because while it might seem easy and somehow in your head you think that you'll magically have this three minute period later where nobody's bothering you or asking you things or if you have kids they're like asking yelling at you to feed them at five o'clock somehow you're magically going to have those three minutes then get it done now so that you can move on and get more done and more importantly if you're working with a team if you can get something done now that will allow somebody else to continue their work and you don't do it you are a bottleneck you're holding them up and you're preventing somebody else from getting their shit done. And that's, that's not acceptable. So deal with it right now. Dealing with it could include delegating it. So it's a little subset D. And the last one is to defer it. And deferring is a much bigger conversation about when things are better for you and worse for you. And so if you know that you do something, you know, finance Fridays, that's a typical one. So I, there's people who just deal with finance stuff on Fridays, which means that if you get something on a Monday that's finance related, you have to defer it to Friday and not think about it in the interim. But those are the three decisions. 
And then beyond that, for email specifically, there's a lot of stuff that we do in email that should never be in email in the first place. So we need other tools for communicating with other people and other things. Uh, and an example of that is that email should never be used internally within a company. You should never be emailing colleagues. Email is an external facing tool. There should be a separate tool for internal communication, which inherently reduces the number of emails that get to your inbox in the first place. That's really interesting. So is that is that what you, like a Discord or a Slack has some sort of system where yeah. there's folders or like chat you can turn on and off where it's not back and forth. I, I like that. And I've started to do that do that more, but I, I didn't really think about it that way. Yeah, I think that, that makes a lot of sense. You send an email, now there has to be one back and then it's like a, it's you have like a chain going there. Well, and the tool, so yeah, Slack is an example, but the tool doesn't matter to me as much as just having something that's separate. Okay. What 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 do you what do you typically like do you have WhatsApp groups or what's your go to in this type of communication? What do you like to use when you do non email communication between your or what would you recommend to people that have a company or, you know, a, a system of a group like ten people, five people or more? Like what would you say is the most effective way? Or just even like a group text or messaging? No, no, definitely not group text because um, it's hard to track those. So uh, two things would be Voxer and or Slack. And that a little bit depends on the team culture and how they communicate. My team, uh, at least for my sake, I communicate verbally and audibly much better than I do in written word. So 95% of our communication with our team is through Voxer, which is kind of like WhatsApp and you know people might be familiar with that. But if you have a much larger company, then Slack really becomes key. But then even within Slack, you need to have proper channel set up and proper usage protocols and end up having people like uh, communication tools are not project management tools. So if you're talking to somebody on Slack about a project and now you need them to do something that has to go into another tool like Trello or uh, whatever you want to use for, or Airtable, whatever you want to use for project management. But that has to move out of Slack at that point. And how, so just to give me a little better idea and maybe everyone at home, what with your team here, I'm just, you know, looking at your website and it, you know, you have a really nice website. Uh, it's how many people are on your team? Like, do, do you have, what, what would in your particular space, like what are, do you have, you have an assistant? Like, give me a rundown of your, your uh, program, your protocol for your team. Like, what do you, what do you have? What does your day to day consist of with dealing with people and, and as a, for a team? So generally speaking, as you grow a team, uh, as, a, as an entrepreneur, you want to have people on your team that are filling the roles of things that you are really competent at, but not excellent at. Uh, and I'll, I'll explain what that means. And then the stuff that you're really kind of bad at and you don't like doing, but you're kind of doing it anyway, that's stuff that you should just straight up outsource. So for example, on my team, I have three people. Uh, I have a writer or a content person. Amy is my writer. Uh, Courtney is our business operations person. And then Joanna runs the coaching side of things sort of under me. Uh, I'm a competent writer. We've written several books and several blog posts. And it's a really important part of our business. But it's not something that I would say I'm excellent at or particularly efficient at. So in that case, I want to have a writer on my team. Uh, but bookkeeping is straight up outsourced to, uh, we use a company called Paro.io. Uh, we use a virtual assistant company called Magic, where we have a, a team of 20 VAs working for us pretty much full time. And they do hundreds of hours of work for us every, every month, uh, which has been life saving. So I'm, I'm really uh, sort of, for most startups and most smaller companies, I'm really kind of anti employee because uh, I just think it provides for more flexibility and, and uh, it, it's just more cost effective, honestly, as you grow a business. And so I, my team is three people and then we have dozens, if not over a hundred contracted services from graphic designers to coders, programmers, uh, which is the same thing, to uh, automation specialists and copywriters and translators and everything in between. And do you think, is that something that people, is there, is it hard for someone to look and say, you know what, I think it's time. I, I don't know if it justifies to have an assistant or to take on a monthly cost. Like what, what's a way where someone could maybe they're holding themselves back. Is there a rule when it's time to say, you know what, I got too much on my plate or I want to delegate something. I, I think I should add an assistant to what I'm doing. Is there a way to sort of uh, determine that point or how, if it makes sense? Cause I mean, it takes money to make money and at some point. Like, I think that's, that's something that I've, 
yeah, my team, I don't have a necessarily large team. I, you know, I've had an agent. I have uh, Vadrin, who is basically, you know, he, he does graphics, design, may, manages websites, deals with just a ton of different things for me. But in terms of having somebody to do that, I think sometimes people just, they're like scared. They're like, I don't know, it's going to cost me this. But they're not looking at the big picture and freeing up their own time or doing other things more effectively. That's sort of what you're speaking about. Is there a, is there a way that you can sort of, like maybe take a shot or take a chance or, or to look at the bigger picture and maybe add one or two people to your to your whole uh, program because you know for my world with poker um, it's a little bit different and also with the Twitch content creation side I think that's a uh, it's a little bit hard to look ahead at the bigger picture and would you have any advice on when to do that or when to take a step and say yeah I think it's time to add someone to my team. Yeah, so generally speaking, what we see is that uh, if you're a sales in your company, it doesn't matter what industry you're in, but if your sales are somewhere between 100 and 300,000, you need to be focusing on sales. Like that is the purpose at that point is to bring in revenue, make money, bring it in. Uh, once you get to 300,000, that 300,000 a million mark is really that crucial sweet spot where you're looking at bring, uh, putting systems and processes in place that replace what you as the founder do well. Uh, and we see this cross industry all the time. Uh, so you don't want to do it too early. You don't want to do it too late. Uh, and we see it, lots of people doing it too late and lots of people who like they've made $10,000 and now they want to hire an assistant and bring all these people in. So there is an element of hustle that you need to sort of get you to that point where you, you can do this. So uh, again, focusing on sales from uh, 100 to 300,000. And then once you're, if you're making $300,000 at that point, you really should start to look at putting systems in place and automations and possibly outsource providers to help you uh, get to that next level. I would say that in that same sweet spot there, once you get to the upper end, like when you're starting to approach a million, that's where, where you really start to think about building a team. That doesn't mean that you won't have team members at that point, but for the most part, they'll probably be contractors, maybe they're part-time, uh, maybe you have one or one full-time sort of person or maybe a partner. But then once we get over the million dollar mark, that's when you start to actually create like a real org chart. Uh, and, and start to build real company structure. So there's a there's a time and place for all of these things and uh, you, you sort of just follow where you're at there. Let me ask you, how did you get in touch with Elliot Rowe? How, Cause that's our connection here. What was, what got you to be, I guess you're not only what, what got you to start working with Elliot Rowe and how much has that type of stuff mindset, like you're you know, talking maybe a little bit about your daily routine. Cause I think that's fascinating. I've been hearing about this 5 a.m club or the reasoning the men, the methodology on what that does like how that how that can impact your day and obviously with kids you know could you maybe go through your daily routine and do you, you know and even like practices such as do you turn your phone off do you like go dark for an hour are you shutting does it like all right family time my kids are home we have dinner and then I'm done for the day like no phone no work or I think I think that's also something I'm struggling a bit with um is shutting off because it's just there's always stuff so there's you know now there's like there's there's skype there's slack there's discord there's telegram whatsapp regular text email um you know it's just endless so it's like it's like a rabbit hole of information and i'm the kind of guy i hate having a message you know if i see like one pop up on my whatsapp i want to i want to look at it and then it's like all of a sudden then it spars you and all these other things so can you maybe go through a little bit of your routine and some practices there because i think that's like one area I would really like to improve on is is sort of disconnecting from the phone or chats at, at, at different times of the day or different phases. Because um, you know, obviously, my wife's here; she's pregnant. There's really no immediate things that I need to be worried about. So you know, on, on like within an hour, for example. So that that I think is something I'm really have a have a bit of an issue with, and I, I sh I'm sure you see more nowadays. You know, it's like we're almost cyborgs, right? Our phone is like. It's like a, it's like a, it's just, you, you look around, you go to dinners, you go places, people are just on it looking down the whole time. And I'm definitely guilty of being, they've, some of my friends have actually named my phone, it Mochi, they have, it's got a name, like years ago they would say this, I've gotten, I think better, but I'm definitely like always on it. And again, it's not like I'm just scrolling through Instagram or Twitter, I'm trying to be effective, I'm doing things, but it's like, I, 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 have a, I need to find a better way to shut it off or, or be, have some some uh, implementation of rules to be effective. I would love to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, uh, so I, I don't, ha well, so first of all, the way I kind of connected with Elliot is that uh, I have worked with somebody who runs uh, Elliot's business. So uh, he's 
he sort of introduced me to Elliot and actually did a hypnotherapy session with Elliot, which I found really amazing. And then uh, Elliot invited me to that, to that group, which was, which was great. Uh, mindset is the biggest thing that goes into all of this stuff, right? In my opinion, the tools are really secondary because if you think about, so, so many people, let me sort of back up here. So, so many people sort of approach these productivity challenges and they come to me with the solution rather than the problem. Right. And we see this all the time. So they're thinking like, oh, I, you know, I just need this tool to get my project management under, underway, or um, I just need to hire this person and that'll fix everything. It just never works that way. We need to look at the systems first and sort of how we do what we do. So um, all that to say that uh, the mindset, the way that we approach this stuff, the way thinking about your devices as your devices, your way of communicating with your world rather than the other way around. And also setting out protocols in advance of, as you just said, you know, your wife is pregnant there and there's not a lot of stuff really that definitely needs your attention immediately. You have to set uh, in sort of out front what constitutes an emergency and what doesn't and how to communicate in those situations. There's pretty much nothing in my life uh, in my business, rather, there's nothing in my business that I would say is an constitutes an emergency that does not exist, and that's not just you know didn't naturally happen. We're really set up that way. Uh, in my own life, you know, if I get a call from the, one of the kids' schools, like no matter what I'm doing, I'm going to stop and take that call because uh, that's that's something I would consider urgent. But anything beyond that, there's nothing really urgent. So how I sort of set up my day, I do not have a morning routine. Uh, because I pretty much wake up when one of the kids wakes me up and that's usually, you know, five forty-five, six o'clock in the morning. So I don't have that, that opportunity necessarily to get up and do a morning routine, which is fine. Uh, I have a bit of a night routine, but the way to think about the day in some ways is how, who you're sort of spending that time for or who that time is focused on. So for me, six to nine in the morning is for the kids. Uh, we're getting them up, getting them dressed, uh, taking them to school and everything and then at nine o'clock is nine to three or nine to two thirty really for me is work time that's like clear work time talking to clients uh meetings live stuff and then i pick up the kids or i pick up one one of my boys uh at three and from three to eight is basically kid time again eight to ten is uh wife time and then ten to eleven is kind of like me time usually that's where i'll sort of read or catch up on or not even catch up but I have a bit of a brain dumping process that I go through where I just offload a whole bunch of things into Trello and that just makes me sleep like a baby. So uh, as long as there's sort of some time for each of those in the day, then then that seems to work really well. And I have a clear idea of when those times are and I sort of compartmentalize that as well. But because so much of what we do, what I do is asynchronous, uh, meaning like I can send a message on Boxer and somebody can respond to it two hours later, that's fine. I will sort of jump in and get things done throughout the day, but my approach to it is like, I'm using the tool to communicate what I need to give to people and that's it. And because we're so set up to remove bottlenecks, nobody, I know that nobody's ever waiting on me for something. Uh, a great example of that is that Amy on my team will always send me a draft of an article before she publishes it every time. Uh, whether it's on Medium or a Facebook post, something like that, she'll send me it to review. And if I don't review it, within an hour, she knows that she's supposed to go publish it. So she's never going to be waiting on me. It's never going to be like, oh, I was out for the day, so you couldn't publish an article because we've set that protocol up in advance. So, okay, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And then you said, so in terms of, but what about like the nighttime stuff and turning off the phone or having a set? Oh, yeah. How does it, because that, that to me is one, like I've been trying to do that where I set a time. All right, I have like an alarm on my phone even. It's like this time phones off or you know computer off just done and time with my wife is that um the thing is like again currently with you know i think it's also important not to, for me personally how i view it, it it's good to have rules but it's also like certain times situationally or you know projects or things that are happening that maybe are a little yeah. different you can't just be like oh always this is happening i think it's good to have no. that kind of like alarm or kind of jolt like all right this is time do i need this is it urgent 
do I do I need to be doing anything else? But just kind of have that that space of a reminder. But for me, you know, that's something I'd really want to do as well. It's also difficult because working with different time zones, people. Um, you know, in my mind, I would love to go to bed at 9 p.m. and get up at five or four. You know, that that to me seems like a great idea. It just a little easier said than done. I'm also triggered with. Or I'm, I'm I'm structured to be later night owl. I play a lot of you know. I used to play a lot of cash games very late. Um, playing online tournaments, streaming on Twitch, being on late, having the computer. You know, it's like a, when you finish streaming for eight, 10, 12 hours, you need an hour or two to unwind, a lot of late nights. And I'm not really a, built as a morning person, but I would like to be so. That whole early to bed, early to rise makes a man wise. Benjamin Franklin type of thought. Like, I, I get it. I dig it. It makes sense, right? You're up at five. But that, but that might not be ideal for you, though. Yeah, exactly. That's I mean, that's another thing. It's like everyone's different. Some people need more sleep than others. Some people work differently, uh, also are more effective. But you know, just looking at it from like a perspective of from my wife and from family and stuff like that, that is uh, something I really do want to be present for my my son and my family. Hopefully, you know, who knows, have more kids. Like you have four. You know, that that's super important to like because ultimately that's what it's about. Like, what's the point of working hard? Like, you know, I think we're lucky in the sense I, I can tell you love your job. You love how your message you provide. You're giving a lot of value to people with it, being able to pr- promote the message. Um, you know, I think that's uh, that's something that that's ultimately that's the goal, right? To have time and be be, be able to spend with the people you love and, and uh, cherish that. So that's that's ultimately why I think your message is so powerful, and I think that it's it's really interesting. So you know, I think that's. Um, that's something that I want and that's something that I'm worried about almost that it's like looking forward. I wonder if that's going to be obtainable to do that with family and have all that time. Like I just don't want to get down that rabbit hole because yeah. there's so many people that work so hard. They work forever. They love working. And it's like becomes like they're working till midnight and you know, oh, but, but for what? You know, it's like a, what's a, when it's never enough. When is it enough? And when can you just sort of set those parameters for yourself? Yeah, so to me, like an ultimate sort of work-life integrate, there's no such work thing as work-life balance. It's work-life integration. And uh, if you have it set up, well, I mean, and I, I realize that this is this is really ideal in terms of what I have created at this point, but I know that it's achievable because so many other people have done it through our, our work, is I'm super excited when I'm with my kids at the end, like when it gets time to go to work, I'm very excited to get work done. And when I'm sort of wrapping up work, I'm very excited to be back with the kids. Uh, And I feel like that is the balance in a lot of ways. So it's, it's very achievable. And one of the things that you always have to keep in mind as a parent, I think is the same thing as the, in a plane, you know, putting the oxygen mask on yourself first before you put it on your kids. If you don't take care of yourself, then you're not able to take care of anybody else. So hopefully that doesn't, you, you taking care of yourself doesn't come at the expense of anybody else, but we can't completely give that up. And I think that, and I've certainly been guilty of that. It happens as a parent, it sort of inherently will happen. But uh, as long as at some point you carve out some time for you to sort of get those things done. And if you can set yourself up in a way that is an asynchronous communication method, meaning you're flexible, then you'll be fine. For sure. Well, we just got, guys, we have a, a tweet out. I just sent it out. This was uh, it was supposed to be sent out. It didn't get put out. We're gonna give away fifty dollars. So if you're if you're watching on there and or if you see this, Ari, I just tagged you in this uh, tweet. So we're gonna give away fifty dollars for someone if they ask a question and it is uh, the one we choose on here to answer. So this is a uh, late got a get late into the podcast. We got this out. I don't know if I sent you the link. Um, hopefully we get this was. I was wondering like there's. We had a we had a cut at the beginning. We've also uh, you know it's it's interesting for me. I wanted to not be I I love talking. I can talk forever mm-hmm. on Twitch. Um, that's just like my thing. So I see myself having a lot of podcasts, short and sweet. And it's yeah. it's one of those things where um, you know I think also like that. So I didn't want to be Jeff Gross Poker Podcast. I just I, ch- I I have a YouTube channel, but I started a brand new one and doing Jeff Gross Podcast because I really do like stuff like this. Like outside of poker, very interesting people and topics I want to talk about, not limit to poker. You know, I think my audience is like 97% poker. So there's a couple things. One, we blew the tweet uh, today. Also, the time's pretty early um, for my my uh, my audience for, for typical, but we do have that out. So hopefully we have some people that 
that hop in here and do pop on. But you know, Ari, we're uh, new studios, new stuff. We got a couple uh, miscues today. I think you know, I can tell you. I'm looking here now. Let's go. We'll we'll go over to Ari. There is his content's the content, right? As yeah, for sure. No, that's why these are fun because it's like, look, if someone comes on, like honestly, I can care less. Part of me wants to just do the recorded ones and only voice, but I think it's fun to do video. I think it's fun yeah, to. Sure to have uh, the opportunity if people want to come on and watch live, but it's it's up for people to review whenever. So it's great. How, when Where can people find your podcast? I know you have, you've been doing that for how long? Uh, seven years now, actually. So it's, it's funny because my second episode was right after my son Ben was born. So I know, like always know, uh, you know, when, how long it's been, it's been seven years. And uh, I think we're on episode 365. Which wow. Is, which is yeah, it's 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 been fun. Although I have to say, this is the first time, and you're the first one experiencing this, where I have a proper like mic set up with a uh, mic arm and everything. And this is so. This is after 365 episodes. You know, I got the the setup properly. <laughs> yeah, me. I like I told you too. I just got this lighting and this stuff set up here as well, and it's it's fun, man. I love content. I love creating. I love providing. Uh, insight into interesting stuff and I think like you know again I'm I'm so excited about your course truthfully I've done uh, meditation courses I've done um, some other work I've done Elliot stuff I've done personal development courses but to me this is like it's just very exciting because I think for what it is and the amount of time you know this is a one day course here I'm gonna go ahead and flash over again you have you have it up on the side here let's see I have uh, the less doing this is the replace well the replaceable founder course this is the so this is the online one correct uh the replaceable founder is the online well and, i'm sorry yeah the replaceable founder course is the online one and then there's the replaceable founder intensive which is the uh the in-person live one and that's the one so i'm going on march 6 i am fly i'm going to mexico city this week and then flying in for that ari and i are going to do a podcast on his podcast at some point we'll, we'll either do that live in person or we'll do another one um mm -hmm. it, also i want to mention this rage against the machine this is you as a how old were you this is and what is this what 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 was why are you on the cover of the rage against the machine evil empire so can you talk about that for a little bit like this is yeah, just so so crazy of uh randomness to me like what's the connection here were you are you were you a rage fan i well, I mean, I not, listen to so. some of the music growing up. I mean, it's just kind of crazy to be on a cover of, uh, you know, as like a, as a boy. Like, I, I just don't, you know, it's it's pretty cool, especially when CDs. This is like in the the uh, probably the main time when CDs were everything and you know exciting and the Tower Records and all these things. Like, how did this come up? Right, Tower Records. I know yeah, I'm very familiar with Rage Against the Machine. I like some of their stuff and I've listened to it. So you know, what what is this? This comes up when searching you. Um, so uh, my, my father's an art dealer and has been for forever. And when I was 11, one of his artists, this artist Mel Ramos, who was fairly well known at the time, or is fairly well known, uh, painted that as a birthday present for me, uh, just because. And so the band saw it in one of his books and chose it. And they, they changed it to be, it was Crime Buster beforehand. Now it's Evil Empire with the E. But uh, they... Um, they chose it and then they, they it got you know put on the, the cover and there was like a billboard in times square and it, so it came out when i was 15. Oh, man. so it was, i was i was it was popular i was really cool and there were like people walking around with t-shirts with my face on it it was really crazy that's amazing that is that is uh that's a cool little uh that's a cool i'm sure you got a poster or something framed on the wall hopefully signed that's a that's a pretty cool <laughs> pretty cool uh memory or, or thing to have you know and it's ingrained in time that's awesome yeah um yeah it was odd odd thing to happen but it was fun what's up eric beck and lucas gabriel guys sorry we are this is the first time we didn't tweet out before the podcast started so that was uh air on my end I, we've just been we've been uh, a little bit jammed up here no excuses but we do have ari mizel on the on the uh, horn here who is one of the industry leaders is there anyone else that is do it like in this type of space like who is there i don't want to say competitors but who are some maybe other people they may have heard of or or do similar type work is there any like super super like a tony robbins it's not it's not really it's like different but like what what kind of uh... different he's not teaching a productivity system and getting things done is a productivity system for sure but i think it's it's sort of very sort of hyper focused so i don't i don't know any other real competitors necessarily in terms of what i do but uh, there's definitely other people in the productivity space. Is there any course or any way, like from um, you know Elliot Rowe or Tony Robbins or any type of, is there any stuff that you've done 
that is that really like jumped out to you where you were like you know what wow this like shake you know because this is what i'm hoping when i go to yours uh this is type of like where i'm just gonna be like wow like life changes there's some stuff you've done that just sort of like just you woke up the, the next day and you're like wow like I'm, I'm gonna reshape my life or i'm gonna do something and really implement it a big jolt in your day-to-day is there anything that stands out to you that you've done either a person a talk a course anything that really stands out for you um i mean i so when i overcame crohn's disease i did a tedx talk here in new york which was a really sort of big milestone for me and was uh really really meaningful i i felt uh but i've also i've had the opportunity to work with tony robbins he wrote the the quote for the back of my last book actually and uh, with the U.S. Army, I've done stuff with the British government. Like so, this, this method is applied to a lot of different organizations really well. And let's see, my wife actually she sent something on the side. Uh, the practical tools. Huh. I'm not sure. There's my wife's Brazilian, and I she, I, I understand 95 percent of what she asked, but I didn't quite get that one. Um, she's gonna be at the course. She's gonna be able to ask you in person. I do see some questions <laughs> coming in. We'll wait till the. Till the kind of end here, which actually I know you have another commitment, so we are gonna have to cut it pretty soon. But we'll let some of these questions come in. I see some good ones on the side. Um, what do you think the fundamental though is on procrastination? What what is that heart there? Like what? Why do people procrastinate? Why do people just kind of like get into a vicious cycle? Why do they overcomplicate things? What do you think is the core reason on that generally for people as a whole that just kind of can't seem to get get stuff going or procrastinate? So, I mean, the most procrastination is just fear, honestly. And uh, a lot of it is like, per, like um, perfectionism is the exact same thing as procrastination. It's just, you're just avoiding done basically. But really important distinction is that there's procrastination, which is where you've made a decision to do something. And then you're pretty much like actively putting roadblocks in your way. Like you're gonna get busy work done. Oh, I'll just, you know, watch this YouTube video first. Uh, the bigger issue is something called acrasia, actually, which is a, uh, a, a much bigger problem, which is, acrasia is where you have, you know you should do something, but you actually haven't made the, the decision to do it. Uh, way worse, way, way more dangerous. And that's what we end up dealing with a lot of times. And some of that is because they just don't know what the, the steps needed are to get the thing done. So we confuse procrastination sometimes with acrasia. And with acrasia, you really have to just look at the system that you need to put in place and figure out what is the very first step I need to take to get that going, uh, which is not procrastination. And okay, and so and that would you say that's, that's like one of the fundamental uh, blocks for people or if you were to say one thing if you were to say go out there people are watching they come come back and see this what would be the one things one thing you would say to someone if you know what hey I think you just you can get more done you could be better what would be the one one tip or one sort of advice you would give to someone to just sort of uh, make be more efficient uh, if you were just to, if you could only give one a piece of advice um, so start asking yourself why a lot more right so look at look at um, so that you're frustrated with email. Why is that? Well, because there's too much of it. Why is that? Uh, well, because uh, I, I'm putting too many things into email or I don't have a system in place to process those. Why is that? You start sort of backing it out. Uh, but if we just honestly, like it sounds simple, but being a little bit more observant of how we do the things that we do is the, the best advice I can give anybody. And do you, is this something like, do you find for your wife or friends, like, is this something that you think, you know, like obviously your wife, four children is, a, is a, it's a pretty, pretty big task. So, I mean, she's, I'm sure she, you know, she's helping manage and, and de- dealing with that. Like, is this something you would, is this more for men, more for women? Is this something that people like less doing? Could anyone apply this? Or is this more for someone that's, you know, de- dealing with day-to-day emails and, and tasks? Like what, a, let's just call a housewife, for example. Is this something that you think they would benefit tremendously from? Or is it more, People are dealing with emails, dealing with uh, work and, and, and type of, um, you know, project managing, I guess you would say. Like, well, who, who's going to benefit the most and who would you maybe, someone might think this isn't for, but you think it still would be good for them to do? Like, how, how would you break it up into uh, that, value? That, that's part of the problem, actually, is that it applies pretty much to everybody. Like, I've, I've seen this work with solopreneurs, with stay-at-home moms, with uh, retirees, and as I said, like with government, with army, like everything. So uh, it, it, it works really broadly because everybody, our minds all work the same. And if this is about mindset, then it shouldn't really matter what you're doing with it if you can be more effective. And uh, so th- what the class in New York on the six, there's gonna be 20 to 20-ish, 20 to 40 people. Um, do you feel, 
Is this like for you? Do you like to do one on one work more? Do you enjoy these courses live more? What do you think is your the way you you think you get your message and sort of um, get it across better? Do you like to do one on ones or do you enjoy this court the the group? Yeah, setting? we don't we don't do one on ones. Like I really love to teach, you know. So I like these group settings, and we do our our coaching program that we run, which is called the Less Doing Leaders, is a is a group coaching program. Um, I, I just think that you know there's so much more to gain from that sort of uh the group experience we learn we, we learn so much more from experience i think than from just learning techniques okay and and uh in terms of like travel how does that play into for you like how hard because so the thing i noticed i believe you do elliot does they have a, a place to you can post for zoom or you can like book a podcast. So, I mean, that makes a lot of sense, right? You have slots, you know, when you want to go live, you have Monday, Wednesday, Friday for your viewers, you have people kind of slot in. Like for me, I just, I guess it's a little different too about traveling. You know, I have like, I have trips or I have stuff or I don't know exactly where I'm going to be or who's going to be coming to visit or what's going on. So like, how do you, is that just, is that very important in terms of scheduling to just sort of lock in firm things in advance? So you get people and you, you know, and change like that to me gives me, it seems a little bit difficult to do, but I would love to do that is have like, all right, I'm going to do a podcast Mondays, Wednesdays, or, you know, live ones these days, have people book in, do an advance. I, generally, my podcasting is, is a few days in advance. I just kind of reach out and try to do it. But it is obviously hard for people to with scheduling and planning to do short notice. So that, that's something I would I would uh, be curious on as well. Like, what's your thought on that? And how do you how do you go about doing that? And just do sometimes I guess have to change, right? If it's like, oh, well, we want to do this. Or you plan your family vacations, you know, kind of when you're traveling, and then you uh, set it in. I mean, a big part of what we what we teach is is flexibility, you know. So a good example of that is like Thursday, I had a day scheduled that I was going to be in my office the whole day in this you know in this space doing stuff, and we decided to move my office uh, in our house. So to do that, I needed to get a new desk and also get like some closets for my wife. So I drove to IKEA. I dropped out the kids, drove to IKEA, in New Jersey. While I was on the way to IKEA, I did my team huddle on Zoom. Uh, got to Ikea, bought all the stuff, sat in the cafeteria at Ikea, did a client call, drove back, did another client call, and then came in, like unloaded the stuff and did an interview. And then I uh, had a doctor's appointment over Skype. I had this consult with somebody over Skype. Uh, and then I picked up my kid. So I did that in front of one of my kids' schools. Uh, and then I picked up my daughter and my son and took them to a pediatrician appointment. Right. So like, I, it would have been nice if I could do that all in my office, but I was able to do it totally fine. Uh, in getting all those other things done. Okay, well, listen, this is a, this is a, oh, I see, and uh, Damon John, has he done the course or he's, he is a buddy of yours who knows that you do it, you've worked with him or done some stuff with him. Yeah. Looks like he's endorsing that. What's your, have. what's your tie there? So, yeah, some people from his team have done uh, stuff with us. He's, he's been great. He wrote a blurb for one of my books as well. He's awesome. How many books have you written? Nine. And uh, man, so is that is that the book writing process? Is that something too where you have you have ideas, concepts? You obviously have a place you work with. They kind of you just talk to them and they do it. Or how how is that to dive in and write in a book? It seems a little bit overwhelming. I guess nowadays it's not likely you just hand write it all out. Right, you can type, you can talk, and people can do it. Like, what's your format on those type of books? How do you how do you go about that? So for the most part, I actually would teach I would teach a program. So like we taught, I taught the workshop that you're going to come to, and that gets recorded, transcribed, broken up, and that becomes the basis for the book uh, because that's the most natural way for me to get this information out. Is just stand up and teach. You know, if the most natural way for you is to sit down and write, then that's what you should do. But uh, you know, think about the inputs and outputs, and what's the easiest input for you and the best output for your audience in, in, in some cases. So which one? Um, and which is your? Have to wrap. I'm gonna have to wrap up here. I'm sorry. Awesome. All right. Well, listen. All right. We. I really appreciate the time. I just want to. We're gonna give the. I think you already answered it. One of the questions here was. Uh, we again. We got this out really late, so that was on me. But someone just want to say, uh, when you lack motivation, what steps would Ari suggest to improve this? And then we'll let and we'll let you just jet out of here. But I, that's a fifty dollar going to Simon Baker for the question. When you lack motivation, what step would you suggest to improve it? So that's acrasia, right? So that's where you're really looking at what would be the very smallest possible first step that I could take towards that goal. Um, the best way to talk about that is that you'd see on people's to-do lists all the time, write book, 
right? That was on people's to-do list, which is insanity to me. Um, if you want to make a to-do list item, write outline for a book or write one sentence, like something that is manageable for you. It doesn't matter how small it is. It could be something. It's, if you want to learn how to do 100 push-ups, start by doing one push-up a day, just one. You know, so if you're going to eat an elephant, you got to eat it one bite at a time. That's like a, as many metaphors as I can sort of pump in at one time. I but love basically, it. like, try to break down that big task into something that's really small. All right. Well, all right. Listen, I appreciate the time. Thank you so much. I will see you in New York City on March 6th at your course. Less Thank doing. You. Ari Mizell, thank you for your time. We'll see you soon. I appreciate it, my friend. Bye. See ya.